asked to introduce the next speaker here. Um, if you don't know him, this is uh, Mr. Concurrency, or Dr. Heinz Kibbutz, all the way from the island of Crete to talk to you about how to shafe, safely shoot yourself in the foot with uh, Java 9. Now, Heinz is very famous for tearing things apart. I think one of my favorite newsletters of his is how to make Java look like basic. <laughs> and, <laughs> and bubble with, sort and basic. And bubble sort and basic and things like that. So. Um, uh, warm welcome for Heinz, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we won't be disappointed with this talk. Thanks, Actually, Mark. I haven't seen it yet either, so <laughs> Thanks, let's have a hand for Heinz. Let's go for it. So these are the goals of Project Jigsaw. I don't know if Mark is still around, but the four goals. The first goal was to make the JVM smaller so that we can fit it onto, um, I don't know, a pen or something, I don't know. Uh, a toaster, right? <laughs> uh, the second one's to improve the security and then improve application performance and make it easier to, to, to maintain and work with it. Now, the, the first one, to me, it's you know, I'm not really that convinced that it's so necessary as they might have thought because we've basically lost the war against the, against the phones. And um, yeah, you know there might be some small devices, and you know even for microservices, you really want to reduce your memory footprint. And classes are loaded on demand anyway. So anyway, so but the second one I think is the real reason why why we did this, or the real the real selling point, is to make Java more secure. And they gave us this wonderful <laughs> security, wonderful module system, and then we were just complaining from the beginning until the end that we wanted to break it, right? So <laughs> but we want to have unsafe, right? We want that stuff. And so they, they've sort of given on a little bit for us. Um, and we'll, I'll show you how to, uh, how to get around it now in a moment. They also said that we, they want to improve application performance. Now, obviously, they would say that. They're not going to say we're giving you something new and it's going to be slower, right? So, you know, I'm not, I don't really believe that too much, although there are some parts which are faster. Um, and then make it easy to construct and maintain. Yeah, of course, again, that's sort of the, the sales spiel. Of course, they would say that. They would say, they're not going to say it's going to make it worse and terrible and slower. It must make it, something must be better. Otherwise, you wouldn't go through the pain of doing this. So what can we do? Well, in the beginning, Java was supposed to be you know, really, really safe and secure, and you couldn't get out of the sandbox. And I remember 16 years ago, 16 and a half years, I know, I know really well because my daughter was, wasn't born yet, my first daughter. And um, I was asked to, to do a course in Mauritius, island of Mauritius, and one of the topics they wanted was how do you do, how do you work, how do you, do, how does, how do you configure the security manager in Java? How do you write a policy file? And that was the last time anybody asked me how to do that, right? <laughs> People just don't care. You've got these, this wonderful technology for specifying exactly who can do what, who's allowed to do deep reflection and who can't, and we don't actually use it. Because, well, you know, um, sure it'll work, you know, let's just use it. And so even though we've had a lot of security in place from the beginning, we didn't really use it too much. Now, um, in the early version of Java, you, you were a bit stuck with, if you wanted to do compare swap and things like that, you actually had to write JNI code. And they didn't want to do that anymore, so they added, I'm not sure exactly which version was Java 3 or 4, somewhere around there, they added this class called sun.mist.unsafe. Now, You've obviously heard that name before. Everybody's heard that name. And if they'd called it something like transfer, no one would have looked at the class, right? But because they called it SunMisk Unsafe, everybody says, how do I use this? I want to try this out, and this sounds really cool. There's another class called Shared Secrets, right? Who's heard of shared? No, listen, don't put your hand up, right, <laughs> if you've heard of it. And what you can do with Shared Secrets is you can construct a string that has a pointer to an existing char array. Yeah, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? It doesn't actually work in Java 9 anymore because in Java 9 they've replaced char array with byte array. But before Java 9, you could actually have two, two strings that point to the same char array, and then if you change the char array, of course, the string would also, tra also change without any security violations except for, you know, well, you shouldn't be using shared secrets. Now, Unsafe was added in the JDK in order to help the JDK developers. 
to do things like create objects without calling any constructor, to throw exceptions, even though you're not supposed to, like, for example, the new instance method of class does that. Uh, you could make large blocks of memory and, and deallocate those as well. Um, you could even, um, you can do compare and swap, of course, those are one of the primary reasons where this was being used. You could set fences, that's relatively new. And um, in Java 9, no, <laughs> the funny part is, even though they've told us you're not supposed to use this stuff, they added a new method in Java 9. So you can release uh, native buffer resources, so map byte buffers and things like that. So that's, that's, of course, another way to really shoot yourself in the foot. So how did we get to notice unsafe? As I said, if they'd called it corba.anything, we wouldn't have looked at it. But um, what happened was there was this cl a class called, there is this class called concurrent linked queue. And concurrent link queue had a rather boring implementation of using atomic reference field updaters. Now, these field updaters um, <laughs> suffer from something called amnesia. Every time you call it, it has to see, uh, I'm not sure, am I actually allowed to do this or not? Right? And so it checks every single time you call it if you're allowed to do this. And so that, of course, is expensive and, and costly to always check whether or not you're allowed to actually call this method. And so. Um, in Java uh, 7, they replaced this mechanism, which worked, and um, with this new one, which uh, with, with class called unsafe. Now, unsafe had this mechanism to protect it against us programmers, where when you called unsafe to get unsafe, if your class wasn't in the boot class path, it would throw an exception. So, what we did was we simply accessed the, 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 the unsafe instance using deep reflection. So we just bypassed the get unsafe method. Of course, this is all very nasty. But um, So when this appeared in Java 7, all of a sudden we saw, wait a moment, there's something better than atomic references, field updaters, um, which, by the way, they have improved them now. Now they actually are very fast too. But at the time, there was, th 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 there was now this new alternative. And what we do is we say unsafe.compare swap object, this points to the actual object, and then we have an item offset. Now, what is this item offset? Oh, what's this here? Put ordered object. Hmm, that might be quite interesting. It's cheaper than volatile. So we can write some cool code with that too. And um, the offset is basically um, a point into your, or the, the, the number of bytes from the beginning of your object until your field appears. So it's nice point arithmetic. And um, you should try to get this right. right? If, you, if you make a mistake, you're going to change random places in your memory, which isn't very healthy. So this is how the code worked. And um, once the genie was out of the bottle, it was very hard to contain it, to say, guys, you shouldn't be using unsafe. And but people said, but, but, we, but we want this stuff. We want to do this, this fast compare and swap. So in Java 9, they clean it up. So we've now got um, something called a var handle. And this var handle um, is, is basically what we call enhanced volatile. It's, it's one way of calling it. It's enhanced fields. Um, it basically gives you something just like the atomic um, reference field updater, but without the amnesia. So what you do is up front, you call method handles.lookup, and it finds out from the context of where you currently are whether or not um, you have got permission to see, that, uh, to, to see that class. And if you don't have permission, then it just throws an exception and you're going to have some, I think, access exception or something, and then you'll throw an error after that. Now, the, once, you've, once you've determined that you're actually allowed to do that, then you can use it, and your performance is going to be just the same as unsafe. Um, so this time we set it up, sort of just a few tips. Normally, we, we name it by the same name as the field, but capital letters. So item is item capitalized, um, pointing to the volatile field item over here. Then we can do compare and set. We don't have to do the point arithmetic anymore because we've now got um, a bit more, bit, bit, bit safer mechanism to, uh, I mean, we can't accidentally change completely random places in memory or deliberately. Now, um, the, the, one of the points of Java, Java 9 was to get rid of unsafe. And so initially they put it into some secret package and they forbade us from using it. Um, and they, the whole point was to try and get rid of it from Java to concurrent, because as you can see, um, this was in Java 7 the biggest culprit of using unsafe. And of course, there are lots of people who like doing concurrent code, so we were all copying this. 
And in Java 8, it, it, it actually got worse, not better. You know, we've got more classes in Java 8 and uh, more uses, more classes using this thing called unsafe. And, um, and so when they got to Java 9, they thought, let's get rid of this usage and let's, let's make it really small. So they got rid of all the uses of unsafe. Well, <laughs> um, actually, it's not as bad as it looks because inside Java Lang, obviously they're using a lot because they've got the var handle as a sub sub package of Java Lang. And var handles use unsafe. So this, it's, it doesn't look, it's not like, I know it looks a bit bad, but um, if you look, at, the one you should look at is concurrent. And there they really have, have, have uh, gone forward with a good example. They couldn't always get rid of it because sometimes you've got a bootstrapping issue where you, you, you need a particular class before the var handles have all been initialized. And so you, you know, sometimes they have to use unsafe anyway. So um, Java 9 var handles um, have the following. Um, they, they allow you to do sort of different strengths of reading and writing on fields. There's a plain reading and writing, it's like writing a normal field. And there's on the other side of the spectrum, there's volatile, which is the strongest. And in between, you've got other ones. You've got get, acquire, set, release, which is um, not as strong as volatile. And then get, set, opaque, this one is, is quite weak. Um, you do have, for example, atomic updates, so you're sure that if it's a 64-bit value, it's written atomically, not with two halves, unlike a plain field. But you, you can't really use get set opaque for inter-thread communication. So you can't really write a queue with get set opaque, but you can, there are other places where it's used. Uh, there's also a bunch of fences, and if you want more information, there's, um, there's a document that Doug Lee wrote with some friends. Now, um, one of the interesting parts of this is um, how um, long adder works. And long adder is a class which is based on another class called Stripe 64. And they use something called lock striping to achieve very good parallelism and uh, low contention on updating the values. Basically, the way it works is that um, if you make a long adder and you update it from a thread, because there's no contention if there's only one thread, it will just have a single cell. But as more and more threads use this long adder, every time you get a, a, a compare and swap failure, CAS failure, it will increase the size of the array until um, you've, you've, you've reached some maximum, which is somehow in relation to the number of hardware threads you've got in your system. So um, the cell object is also marked with at contended. Um, so I'll talk about at contended a bit more in a moment, another way to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, now, one of the things which is interesting is that the threads are allocated to a particular cell, but they want to do it in such a way that, it's, it, that you don't have uh, multiple threads using the same cell, at least not that often. Um, and, of course, you could use a thread ID, but the thread ID is just the number which could increment, and it can actually be reused eventually at some point. So it's, it's not that reliable. So the question is, how do they actually go and, and do it? Now, um, if you look inside the Java 8 class of uh, Stripe 64, so if you go to long adder and you go up to Stripe 64, they've got something called a probe. And this probe is used to decide where, um, it's, it's somewhere some mathematical genius stuff, and then they decide it must go into this part of the array. Now, where is the probe from? Well, the probe is actually from a class. From it, it gets it gets yanked out of out of thread local random, right? Now, in Java seven, thread local random was um, a random number generator based on the thread local class. Now, we all know thread local. So, um, each thread has had its own instance of the th of its own thread local random. In Java eight, they changed that. In Java eight, uh, the problem with having for each thread having its own is that you have to have a hash map lookup every time you call current on the thread local random. So they change it in Java 8 to instead have a singleton of thread local random, and they decided to store the information for working out the next thread local random value inside the class thread. Yeah, I know that you're shocked now, but it's true. So if you look inside thread, you'll, si you'll see there are, there are so some fields in here which are used for, uh, for doing random numbers sitting inside thread. So um, there we go. And again, contented. We'll talk about that a bit more later. And this thread local random probe happens to be a good mathematical number to use for 
for, for getting a good distribution of the threads throughout this array. So how do you get hold of this field? Because you need, remember, we need to get hold of it really quickly. We want to be able to read the value as if it was a local value, as if it was part of our class. It mustn't have like expensive reflection, you know. So it must be as fast as possible. And so that, for that, they used unsafe. And um, this is in Stripe 64. They said unsafe, get int. And you can see the probe they did here with point arithmetic to access it. Now, um, this is how, how they did it in Java 8. And... Um, the, the, the point of this, of course, was, was again to improve on math, random numbers. If you ever need random numbers, you never use math random anymore. That's, uh, <laughs> it's been bad for a long time. Um, and the, the problem in Java 9, they didn't want to use unsafe. In the early versions, they did use unsafe. And then one of the things they did was they moved over to having a method handles lookup that was like a complete you know, god lookup, could do anything and access any values. Um, and they got, got, got away from that, and now they actually give us a, a method called private lookup in, right? So typically, you can only get a var handle that's inside your class. But with private lookup in, you can actually get a lookup that allows you to, to also see fields outside of your control. So let's try this out. We'll go to Java 9, um, and we'll try to play with a bit of do a string demo here. So string demo, and we'll say um, var handle uh, value equals method handles dills dot private lookup in. Now, we're looking inside the class string, and the lookup here is the context from which you're looking it up. So this will check whether I've got permission to do it. So basically, we know I don't, um, really have the permission to do this. And so um, this, at the moment, in Java 9, will not throw an exception. I want to just re-throw that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I need to do some more work. Um, it won't throw an exception, but it will print a warning. So private makeup, lookup in method handles lookup, and then we can say find var handle on the class string, sorry, string.class, and the name will be value, and the type, I've mentioned this already, is a byte array dot class. Because, of course, Java 9 uses byte array rather than char array. So a bunch of exceptions, but basically this gives you a var handle. Now, with the var handle, oh, okay, we're just going to ignore those exceptions, those warnings. Uh, so then what we do is we can say value dot set. We can say hello and... Then we can say uh, we're going to replace the value of the string hello with the value um, cheers. Right? And then we're going to print out hello. Okay. So what do you think happens when you run this code? Okay. No, it doesn't. It doesn't print cheers because you're not allowed to change final fields with var handles, which I think is fantastic. I'm really happy that they did that. So they, they basically said you, you, you can't change final fields. You can read them, um, but when you try and change them, they complain and they say it's an unsupported operation. You can't do that. We're very sorry. Well, they're not really sorry, and <laughs> they shouldn't be sorry. So, um, so there's another way we can do this. We can say object um, hello equals value dot get um, hello, and then cheers. Now, of course, you know what it is. The object is actually a, a byte array. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to say system.array copy um, from the source is going to be cheers um, from position zero to hello from position zero. And the length we can say array dot length. Oh, what's the set? No, that's the wrong one. Um, dot get length of cheers, which happens to be six, I think. And then we print out hello. Then, in fact, we do get cheers. Okay, there we go. So what I've done is I've copied the, the bytes over from the one array to the other array. Now, obviously, you shouldn't be doing this, right? Please just. <laughs> <laughs> don't take a photo of the slide, please, if you don't mind. <laughs> it's like, don't do this. Don't do this. This is how you, sh what, how you shouldn't be coding, Java. 
Now, there's one problem with this code, only one, right? Who knows what the problem is? Yes. No, 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 none of that. Now, the problem is that it shows warnings. That's the problem, right? We don't want to see these silly warnings. Right? So how do we get rid of these silly warnings? So there's an easy way. You can just say add opens, which basically says, you know, I've put my class into, into, into no pack and into no package, no module. Um, so I'm going to just say that anything in Java Lang, I can play with as much as I want. So let's do that. And then this annoying warning goes away. And then it will work much better. So let's run it again. And we're going to say there. And see, now it works perfectly. <laughs> Problem solved. Right? OK. Now, another cool thing we have in Java 9 is, is, this, is this J shell. When I first saw it, I thought this is going to be completely useless, but it's not as useless as we think. Um, and what you can actually do is you can actually uh, do things. Um, you can actually write scripts, like, like bash scripts, in Java. Now, I'm going to show you a quick demo in a moment. One thing that, that you need to do is set up the edit environment so that you have your, you have your real good editor. Um, also, the startup is quite slow, especially if you start up with lots of different imports because it does a whole bunch of backward compa uh, compilation. Now, the startup speed is slow if you compare it to something like Python, but the run speed is blazingly fast. So, um, for, for scripting perp, I know that it's not designed to be scripted, and I, I listened to the talk yesterday, but um, it's, you can still do it, and it's pretty cool. For example, what you can do is you can make your first line to be a, a Java comment, right? Java comment, and then you put in there the path to JShell, so dollar Java home, bin JShell. And then one of the disadvantages with the standard JShell is that, is that you can't return a number from, from JShell which you need if you want to do a script. But if you say minus, minus execution local, then you can. If you say system exit, then it returns a number. So if you want to use it in scripting, you can do that. And then you say minus, minus startup. Default printing is quite a good idea. Um, and then I've got another, fi uh, another file that I've called exit, um, which just contains the line slash exit um, to exit the script at the end. And if you start like that, you can do some a beautiful hello world um, just with J script. Um, here's my... Hello world. Let me just get rid of this loop here. And it basically does, oh, um, okay, the, it looks a bit, the, this exit on this first line is actually just wrapped around from the other side. But this is the first line. And if I, if I do hello world now, if I've got Java 9, then it works very nicely. It prints out hello world. And you can, you, I mean, I know that you guys are completely like dazzled by the speed of this thing. Um, so let's try and time it, hello world. And it's an interesting number that comes out because the real time is three seconds, but the user time is 11.8 seconds because it's doing the compilation of the AppSec syntax tree in the background with lots of threads, so lots of threads going on. <laughs> but you can do some cool stuff. For example, um, you can say um, new server socket. 8080, and you don't have to declare anything. You don't, don't need semicolons. It's a very European-friendly thing. I know your semicolons are really annoying in Europe. Um, so then you can say $1.accept, um, which is waiting for a connection. And uh, if, I now make a, if I now say Tolnet localhost 8080, um, then it's made a connection. That's my $2. And thanks to Patrick, we can now say dollar two dot tron, uh, dot get input stream dot uh, transfer to this Java nine dollar dollar two dot get output stream, and then if we go back to our tunnel, we can say hello world, and it echoes everything back. So pretty cool. Um, so let, let's let's stop this. Oh, you can't press Control C. Uh, let's just kill it. Uh, percentage one. Uh, it doesn't actually die. Okay. So there are a couple of little things here and there, but generally it's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, I've got a, a. If you like Java Nio and Java I, I've got a course on that. There's another link at the bottom, so I won't spend time on this. Um, okay. So um, you can also. 
Now, in Java 7 and 8, we had this, in fact, since Java 4, we've had this problem that you could map a file. So you could take a random access file, get a channel, you can get a map byte buff, and you can work with that. So mapping was easy, but you couldn't unmap the file, which caused issues sometimes. Um, and so you could accumulate these things, and they wouldn't automatically be cleaned up. So there was a way to do it in Java 7 and 8, but and before that, but it wasn't really very safe, but we aren't talking about safe things here, so I think I can show you. Basically, if we take this code and um, we go to Java 8, and um, we copy this in here, uh, let's make a class called mapped test, <coughs> and inside there, <coughs> we've got our a random access file. I'm not going to close it because I'm a Java program. I don't have to close anything. Um, and uh, then we're going to say here, oh, come on, file. OK, throw the exceptions and uh, import this. We're almost there. And do more exceptions, naught, comma, thousand. So now here, I've made a random access file and I'm pointing map byte buff onto the first thousand bytes of this file. If it doesn't exist yet, I'm going to create it and create a file of, a so of size a thousand. Now, um, as I said, I, I can say raf.close, because it's auto-closable if I really wanted to, but I can't say um, buff.close. I also can't say buff.unmap. I can only say map. This is kind of annoying. So um, I've, let's, I've written a little a thing called clones console, which just waits for enter. It's a like really modern code here. And, and if you run this code um, and you connect with jvisualvm, which fortunately still is in my pass, path, because they haven't taken, they have taken away it in Java 9, but not in Java 8. Um, now, you can connect to map test, and there's a plugin you can install that will show you the buffer pools. And you can see here that I've got a thousand bytes used by the buffer pool. So, um, even if I close, now at the moment I haven't actually closed it, but even if I close it, this, oh no, I shouldn't have done that, this buffer pool won't actually be ready. So if I say here, raf.close, and um, in fact, fc.close, um, the map byte buffer will still not be actually um, released. Let me close this here and restart it. And you'll see now if you go back to the VM, that even though I've closed them, it's not um, it's, it's not actually unmapped it. So the only time it unmaps it is when the phantom reference or the cleaner gets, gets activated and then cleans this buffer. So the buffer's still in use, even though I've closed the file. It really shouldn't be like that. It sort of dangles around there. So um, what I can do is after I say wait for enter, I could say buff equals null. And um, then you'll see what happens when you do that. Um, let's run it again. So after the, so it's waiting now. Now, um, if I reconnect to this buffer pool, I think it's this, this one. No, this one. Let's just restart this quickly because it's not working. And there we go. That's the right ID. Open, and if we connect, uh, we'll see that it's going to it's going to have a thousand. All right, now I'm going to press enter, which is going to, um, <coughs> this is going to set it to null. Um, and you'll see it's still a thousand. If I now go and I force a GC, then it's gone down to zero. Okay, and, and <laughs> one of our points, one of the things we try and do is to minimize GCs, right? And uh, so sort of the, the one thing we try not to, we really need to do to clean this thing up. So there was this, there's this trick which is pretty terrible, um, which we can say, uh, uh, mapped, uh, let's take the buffer, and we cast it to the action implementation class. So direct buffer, buff dot cleaner, and then you get a cleaner object back, and then you can clean it. Right? So we don't have to set it to null anymore, we can just say, Let's just get the cleaner from there and then clean it. Now, this is, again, a very, very bad idea. But most of my stuff today is a very bad idea. So we are keeping in, in line with what I'm doing already. Okay? Um, so here we go. It's, it's, um, we're connecting. Let's open to this PID again. And you'll see the buffer pool is still there. 
And now when I press enter, it has cleaned. So brilliant, I've solved the problem of the map byte buffer. Well, eh, not really, because um, you could shoot yourself in the foot again with this uh, quite easily if, for example, after you say, but I did want to say something. Uh, it's like I, I, I gave people this, this offer for my, my Javanaya course, and people didn't, the day later, people said, but I really wanted to subscribe. And I said, well, why didn't you? you know? So if you, if you press enter, and again, then anything could go wrong. I mean, it's, I'm basically writing to some memory that doesn't belong to me anymore. Right? And if this was Windows, well, OK. <laughs> anyway, luckily, I'm not using Windows here. So I'm, I'm, my, my machine is still running which is cool. <laughs> now, in Java 9, um, you, you don't want to use the clean. In fact, you, you know, if you wanted to do this, which you shouldn't, but if you did want to do this, there's another way you can do it in Java 9, which is like this. Um, this is Java 9, and I must just quickly grab this class from Java 9, 8, which I won't show you. Okay, and um, so basically, what you're going to do is inside here, instead of doing the cast, you can say um, unsafe dot get unsafe. But I've actually got an, an unsafe unsafe holder to get that for me. And then there's invoke cleaner method, which is added in Java 9. Um, uh, I'm in Belgium, right? Okay, this is very bad code, and it was added in Holland. So, <laughs> so it's the same type of thing. I invoke cleaner. It does the same. It does some extra checks, but it's still as unsafe as before. And um, if you say put int, then it's going to again break and burn, right? In the same way. But now because I'm using unsafe, it, it gives me a bit of a warning. Um, get rid of that. Of course, I don't need that anymore. It gives me some warning. Oh, it doesn't. It, it, it should. Why doesn't it give me a warning? I thought it gives you a warning. Uh, and it still, it still crashes. Oh, because I've turned off the warnings. That's why it doesn't give me a warning. Remember, remember I've. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll turn them off. Maybe, maybe they're just being kind to us. OK. Now, Javish FM has also gone in Java 9, which is a real pity, because it was a great tool that we could use to uh, find one or two interesting things. Um, it was certainly better than JConsole. Uh, well, marginally better. Um, and they also took away X minus X to run HProf, which might surprise you, because it, that's actually also quite useful. You don't always have the possibility of attaching something like JVM to your system. But on the good side, one of these days, we're going to have Flight Recorder and Job Mission Control open sourced. And then we can switch over to that. So I'm looking forward to those days. Now, um, one thing I tried to do, which of course I shouldn't be doing, but that's how I am, is I wanted to mark my own field as contended. And you can, at contended means that it's going to make your field bigger in order to avoid the situation where you've got um, two objects which are actually not related to each other, or maybe they are, but they're not supposed to be updated together, two different objects living in the same cache line. The cache line is 64 bytes. So if you have two objects in there, um, that can cause performance degradation. So there are some cases, not many, but there are some cases where there's a high probability that objects will be constructed together. For example, with the cell array. When you're making a cell array, there's a very high probability that the objects will be constructed together in the same, because all being happening at the same time. Um, so for that, we want to make them a bit larger so that they, each cell has its own, lives in its own cache line. So if you, if you want to do this yourself, um, in the past it would just be sun miscontented, and everybody was happy with that. Um, but now, if you have got your own field here, um, the compiler doesn't seem to like it very much anymore. They say something like the JDK internal VM annotation is not visible, or some other stuff, I don't know. And, um, and so we really saw that you can do deep reflection, and deep reflection is where I'm accessing private fields of other classes, which of course you shouldn't be doing, but you know. Um, and, but this is different, because here um, I'm compiling against a class which actually was public or is public. It's just that we can't see it because of the modules. So instead of doing um, deep reflection, we, are, we can do this on, at the compile time. So um, this is what you'd do. Um, you'd say minus, minus add exports. So very similar to add opens, we say add exports. And this then allows you to, to have 
your packages or your modules being able to access the, the Java-based JDK internal VM annotation. And um, when you run it, you also have to specifically say that you want to use it for your code. Now, you don't have to do this if you want to have contented. Um, there's another way which is incredibly tiresome and boring, a lot, of, a lot of work. If you look inside the black hole class of JMH, there's an example of how you can do your own contented um, to, you know, but it is a lot more work than just saying add contented. So add opens allows you to do, to do deep reflection. Add exports allows you to have access on public classes, methods, and fields. So add opens means you can do anything you want, basically, and it, it implies add exports. Add exports is only at the, uh, add opens is only at runtime. Add exports is also at it's, it's compile time. So both will be removed in a version of Java, maybe in our lifetime. Some other changes, Java 9. We've got, uh, I know Dr. Deprecators, uh, he doesn't agree. <laughs> uh, Java 9 changes, we've got some new methods for streams, which are another nice way to shoot yourself in the foot. Up to now, if you wanted, if you did a stream, um, it really didn't matter if you did a sequential stream or a parallel stream. The answers wouldn't always be exactly the same because you could do things at the same time, but it would, it would work, you know, it would work. Whereas now it's not necessarily so anymore. Um, if you take a sequential stream and you make it parallel with one of these methods, take while or drop while, you can have some really weird effects. I, I, in one case, I'd got a nice big out of memory error. Um, and it's actually in the Java docs. So you can't even say, but, but you shouldn't be doing this because they said, well, you know, it's a bit like people asked for these methods and they didn't really want to give it to us. And then eventually they said, okay, just take these methods, but at your own risk. GC changes. Now, these are fun. Um, <laughs> So in Java 8, they deprecate an incremental CMS. And uh, a whole bunch of applications actually need that type of stuff. Uh, now, I do understand why, because they don't want to maintain a whole bunch of uh, GCs that not that many people use. Um, but in Java 9, they threw it out, so it was gone. No more incremental CMS. But we still had CMS. So um, that was deprecated in Java 9. So now, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to learn to configure your system with G1 until something else comes along, because um, CMS is deprecated, and who knows when that will be gone. Now, it's very easy to configure G1. All you do is you set the maximum pause time, maximum heap, and you're done. Right, okay, that's not quite true, but <laughs> good luck with that one. Okay, um, one last thing. Um, quite a cool class that we have is big integer. And by the way, Java 9 is now able to work out a square root of big integer, which wasn't possible before. And with big integer, um, they've got this method called square. But square, for some reason, they made private. I mean, who wouldn't want square, right? But they didn't want us to have square. So that square is only for them, right? But we want square. So how do we make square public? That's the question. Now, easy way in Java 8, we could simply copy and paste the class and then change it to be public and then change, patch in this new version using boot class path. Java 9 is a little bit more complicated. There are three steps you have to do. So let's have a look. The first thing is you do the copy and paste. Now, if your boss pays you per line of code, this is a good way to increase your bonus. OK, um, so um, I've got a package here, Big Math. And of course, you need to make sure that your licensing will work for this. And you can see here that um, I've got big integer and I've got these square methods. At the moment, they don't work because, of course, square is private, but we don't really want to keep it that way. So we go to big integer, we say Command A, Control C, and then we go here and put Control V, and we've just got our weekly bonus. Um, now, there is a method called square in here, and square is private. So to make it public, how do you do it? Well, it's easy. You just make it public, right? Now it's public. Um, and then if we go back to our code, begin to test, you can notice that it still is really annoying that it marks it as not working. So um, there's a way around that too. Um, you go to your project settings, and you simply drag this to the top. There we go. And now it's happy. Fantastic. It doesn't actually work yet, because you also have to compile it and patch it and a bunch of other things. But it's generally fairly happy with us now. So um, let's go back to uh, this. So th there are three steps. I have to write them down because I can't, can't remember them all. Basically, the first thing is we have to compile the hacked big integer version. 
because if you try and compile it normally, it's not going to work, uh, which is, of course, great. They, they don't want to make it a little bit difficult for people like me to do what I want to do. And um, this actually is also in the wrong package, I think. So I need to move this, and that was a mistake. Let's move that into Java Math. Okay, so if I compile this normally, recompile big integer, it's going to complain bitterly about this and say, you can't do this, a whole bunch of things, it's not visible and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we don't really care about that. Um, so what we need to do is in the, in the command prompt, we compile it and we create a patch. And then we want to use that patch in order to run our code, so uh, or to compile our code, because now the second step is to compile our code against the patch integer. Again, I'm going to copy and paste this because I can't remember all this stuff. Um, so copy and paste. This now compiles our code against big math, um, against the patch we've created. And then the last step is to run our code against the patch. Now, it used to be a lot easier in Java 8. In fact, I'll show you the Java 8. We've got time for that too. Um, but this is the Java 9 version. And here you can see the big integer is now generated with a very big number. That's the square, 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 square. So um, it's a lot, a lot more difficult than Java 8. In Java 8, you could have simply done the following. Uh, let me just copy this big integer test over. And then we'll show you in Java 8 how easy it is. So there we go. Um, Again, oh, I've actually got the Java math in the wrong place, so I'm not going to show you. It's, it, it is a lot easier. All right, um, so any questions? I've got a few minutes. Ah, oh, a Kirk would like to ask a question. <laughs> would you like to take a microphone, please? Java JVM. You want to say that they've got a, you can get it off, um, off GitHub or something? The J Visual VM gone, Visual VM still in GitHub. So right, you can okay. still get it from there. It's still a NetBeans project. So Visual VM is still around. Um, I'm not so sure, though, whether it was necessarily going to be developed very much in the future, going forward. So no, it's, uh, it's still being developed? OK. So Visual VM is, is available via GitHub, um, but J Visual VM is, is gone. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Stuart. How did you get direct buffer visible? Oh, no, that was in Java 8, right? So in Java 8, you could, you could get the, the question about getting direct buffer visible. You see, they, they tried to stop this in Java 9, and, and they did actually, I think, for, for most cases. If you go back to the Java 9 version, in Java 9, um, if I did this, um, if, if I did what I did before, which was to take the, the, the buffer and, uh, sorry, cast it to a direct buffer, um, buff, dot cleaner dot clean. This is Java 9, and I it's, it complains that it's not visible, right? Java 8 is just imported. Yeah, Java 8 is imported. Java 8, anything, do whatever you want. You know, <laughs> go for it. But Java 9, they try and clean this up to stop you from doing silly things like this, where you can end up, you know, crashing your virtual machine. But... Um, I don't know. It might be possible to get around it with the uh, with 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 Sun dot you know importing or add opens ex add exports. But um, really, of course, you shouldn't be doing this. But in fact, this whole thing is 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 flawed. It, they should have had a better technology where you can actually unmap it, and when you unmap it, then you just get exceptions rather than a crash if you try and use it. So that would be better. All right. Well. Any other questions about Java 9? Did you know that uh, in Java 8, OK, here's a puzzle for you. It's a puzzle. Uh, seeing we've got a few, another five minutes, so here's a puzzle. Um, so uh, here's a class called uh, sorted hash set. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm making a hash set, and I'm I've got a length of 10,000, so 10,000 numbers. I'm putting 10,000 numbers in there. And then 
I say numbers are two string, which iterates over and generates a string for us. And then after that, I make a tree set. We know the tree is a sorted set. And then I, I print out the length and I, I, I compare number string to tree string. Did you know? Okay, let's ask a question. Who thinks that this is going to come back as true in Java 8? Right? Who thinks it's going to come back as false in Java 8? Okay, and some of you are like in the like undecided state, which is okay. Um, when you run this code, it actually comes back as true in Java 8. Surprisingly, right? Quite surprisingly, because we all know that hash sets are not a sorted set, but it, it appears to be a sorted set. And, and the reason I talk about this is I, I spoke to some people um, uh, at a course, and they said, oh, but it's, it's actually sorted. And I said, no, it's not. And they showed me 0 to 100, and it was sorted. I said, wait a moment. Um, because it, it appears to be sorted, but of course it isn't. It's the way that they're doing the rehashing. If you take the same, uh, the same code, um, and you say Java 7, uh, sorry, 7, and you say Java C uh, sorted hash set, and you run it in Java 7, it comes back as false, as it has been since Java 5. It's always been false since Java 4. No, since Java 2. Since Java 2. It's always been false. But now it is, it is true because they've, they've changed the way that the, the, hash, the hash map works, where internally they now have a tree um, when the elements gets too large. So you don't have the problem anymore where you can get a denial of service attack because you've got too many entries inside one bucket inside the hash map, or well, it's, it's less likely to cause a, a, a denial of service attack. So um, a side effect of that is that they've simplified the, the, the hashing function inside the hash map to assign your hash code into a bucket. Right? Um, but because they've simplified it, if the numbers are relatively, if it's relatively small numbers, up to about 65,000, you're going to have them being in, in, in a row, if it's integer, because it's just 0, 1, 2, 3. So if it's above 65,000, it's going to be false. Below 65,000, you can actually be true. Um, now, the reason I'm going to mention this is not to confuse you, because a lot of people might look at hash set and say, oh, that's cool, Java 8. I don't know, this definitely made it sorted as well. But it's not. Right? It's just, it's just a, a weird side effect of, of the way that they, they're doing things. And uh, something that Stuart mentioned in his previous talk was the idea of randomizing hash set. And I think that's an excellent idea to get rid of this type of behavior. People think, oh, this is cool. I don't know that you can do this. That's nice. OK. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me.